So, Sarah, you're going to tell us about mixed methods. And again, Sarah's work has been seminal, I think, in the field, as Andy mentioned. And her book on electoral malpractice was one of the ones that really motivated me to come into this area. So, Sarah, over to you. Well, thank you. I mean, one of the inspirations for um, me thinking about electoral malpractice was actually a paper that Pippa wrote um, <laughs> back in the 1980s on a qualitative study of um, electoral uh, malpractice related issues in Britain. Um, and Pippa herself has done both qualitative, and qualitative work and quantitative work, for which she's better known more recently. Um, but um, this paper, in some senses, is a synthetic overview of the range of different approaches that um, can be used, might be used, perhaps um, might be used in future to study electoral malpractice. In other senses, it's a, a rather introspective paper of what I want to do next kind of thing. Um, but what I thought I'd do is just try to um, draw together a number of the different approaches that have been used so far by Pippa and her colleagues, by other people, um, uh, we've just heard that uh, the project that Pip is leading is, is, is multi-methods. There's survey data, there's expert surveys, there's all kinds of other um, stuff going on there. Uh, it's an excellent example of the type of thing that I think we all should be doing. But I also, also wanted to sort of highlight some other things that um, people who are studying electoral malpractice and electoral integrity haven't necessarily exploited as much as they might be able to and talk about some of the ways we might broaden um, the range of methods we use and, and um, combine them in new and interesting ways. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, I want to highlight a number of the somewhat unusual um, challenges associated with the study of electoral integrity and electoral malpractice. I, mean, I come at this from the point of view of electoral studies, so traditional electoral voting behavior, electoral systems, and so forth. Well, it's all public, it's all democratic, you know, you can measure things, you can ask people about things, there's no particular problems associated with the sensitivities, but when you look at electoral malpractice and all kinds of other issues arise, and so there are a number of challenges there. Um, that are probably more familiar to uh, people who study sort of conflict and that type of thing, or human rights, um, but aren't necessarily so familiar to a lot of people who come at this from the point of view of electoral studies. I'd also like to draw in the potential, um, to largely unexploited potential of, sort of big data out there, There's a wide range of additional data sources that some people are using, um, and um, I think we should be using more. And then I'd, talk, I'd like to also talk about how you can combine um, different uh, methods to try to over, overcome some of the challenges I'm going to be looking at. All right, so basically this is very exploratory uh, work, and I'm coming at this from the point of view of comparative politics. So some of the things I'm going to be saying won't necessarily be too relevant to people who do case studies, uh, because you don't face the same type of challenges of comparability, and if you have a, a great data set on your country, you just go ahead and use it. You don't have to worry about, well, or, or am I going to be able to collect comparable data on other countries? Um, but when, you, when you're doing sort of large and comparative uh, analysis, um, you basically, for the most part, we have traditionally been working with large end data sets that may have a, a, a single indicator for a certain aspect of election or maybe a single indica indicator for an election overall. Um, I, mean, I uh, put together a data set that has 15 indicators, summary indicator, and 14 indicators for, for other aspects of elections. Expert survey we've just heard about has 49 indicators. These are not bad data sets as far as they go. They're pretty detailed in that sense. I mean, 49 is a lot of different aspects of an election to look at. At the same time, um, most of those indicators will be a, a single measure for, for, for that some aspect of that election. They won't take into consideration variation over time and space, which I think... Um, is a potential um, problem. And um, for reasons I'll highlight, um, these data sets are suboptimal when it comes to answering certain types of questions. And I think there's a lot of benefit to be achieved by being able to sort of zoom in on causal processes um, using traditional multi methods research, of, you know, you know, large analysis followed by process tracing type quality of research, but also um, some potentially other types of uh, methods we can use by exploiting some other types of uh, data that are out there and that we might be able to generate. Um, but, but I think by just starting with a, a very, relatively high level, large end analysis, and then focusing in, going to increasing levels of granularity, you can start to see. Um, some detail about causal processes that aren't necessarily so evident when you're simply look at, looking at large-end data sets. Um, so, I mean, that's partly what some what, what Pippa and her colleagues are, are, are doing by using different methods. Um, right, so what, what data are out there? There's large-end data sets, surveys, qualitative data that are comparative. 
Um, when you're talking about comparative data, there are also election forensics um, that we'll be hearing about, criminal justice data that to some extent might be comparable across countries, although that's somewhat problematic in some cases. And then um, there's this process produced textual data, which I've put in red, because I think this is what this is largely underexploited. And, and um, I think we get a lot more, a squeeze a lot more out of, of this type of data than, than has been done so far. Um, all the stuff that's out there online, newspaper articles, reports, briefing papers, written blogs, comments on online for tweets. Um, and in other subfields in political science and international relations, they're doing a lot of really interesting stuff with this. And I think a lot could be done with this. And there's experimental data. So that's basically the sort of the, the range of different types of, of data sources. Um, now, one of the problems associated with using traditional quantitative large-end data sets to study electoral malpractice is firstly time scale and temporal ordering that uh, there's a saying that you know a week is a long time in politics but during an election period a day is a very long time a lot happens and one thing leads to the next now there was a cost the, the micro causal relationships there that can be extremely important when it comes to determining how instances of electoral malpractice take place who's affected who does what and if we don't if we can't really focus in on those rapid changes over time we may be missing a lot there are also of course variations across space you could, you could add space to, to time um, and secondly the covert nature of many types of electoral malpractice um, unlike election most aspects of elections in, in democracies you know, elections are open aside from you know, secret voting um, whereas like corruption and other types of things that are illicit uh, many aspects of electoral malpractice are hidden or even if leaders don't necessarily for strategic reasons always want to hide everything they're doing, they may want to you know, have a show of strength, um, they nevertheless aren't likely to write it down when they're engaging in electoral malpractice. So it would be difficult to collect data on this. They don't document it usually. Um, so this creates sort of challenges for collecting uh, reliable data. You're always using proxies, basically. And then there are problems with the adequacy of the proxies. Um, and finally, there's just a huge variety of different forms of, of electoral malpractice. And they vary a lot from country to country. Um, so these are some of the, the problems associated with studying electoral malpractice. I think you can get a lot of, um, of leverage by sort of zooming in on processes by um, combining election level large end data sets with detailed disaggregated data, disaggregated by space or time, and using the, some of this process produce, uh, produced textual data uh, as a source. Um, because people know things about elections. Elections are public events that mobilize the entire population of a country. And it's in people, if, there's, if there are certain types of electoral malpractice going on, people tend to know about it and they tend to talk about it. They tend to tweet about it and blog about it. So that stuff is available out there. And, and people judge things. They make evaluations of what's happening. And that is also available. And people talk about things. So they, they have their interchanges and debates going on there. So if we could find ways of harnessing this huge amount of textual data that's out there, then we could, um, I think, do a lot of things. I just did a very quick Google search on um, electoral fraud in English and, and other terms in other languages and came up just to, to show you the general range and the amount of stuff that's there that, that I think um, could be exploited. And I don't have time to um, show you the little um, example that I've, I've put together, but it's in the paper um, that you can read in your, in your big packet of stuff. Um, but um, there's various types of things that we could do. We could adapt the ideological tech, uh, techniques for, for ideological scaling, the, the, the word scores type techniques that have been developed to um, look at party placements. You could apply that to develop a scale for various aspects of electoral malpractice. You could do you use automated content analysis to categorize text into different um, uh, discrete categories you define. Or you could use um, uh, event data, which um, the seminar we had last year in Madrid that Jennifer Gandhi presented a very interesting paper using event data. And I think a lot more could be done um, using uh, machine coding techniques. And my little example involved a bit of that, but I don't have time. One final point. Um, I think a lot of what is out there um, can help us to make that leap that Pippa mentioned from sort of solving uh, academic puzzles to actually addressing concrete problems that policymakers want solutions to. And I think one of the main challenges is for researchers to harness the power of big data to solve practical problems and also to increase or to decrease the lag between, between when the thing happens that we're measuring and when we're able to measure it and get it out there and make that available. And Pippa talked about, you know, an election took place. She uh, did uh, a survey of an expert and, and got the data online 
you know, very quickly. And I think, you know, it's reducing that lag um, would really help us to make our research relevant to policymakers. Um, so that if we could generate up-to-the-minute data uh, with what's happening, which is possible if you have a web crawler kind of crawling the web and scraping and analyzing things and automatically co coding it, putting it on your website, you know, you can have stuff that's basically data that's generated simultaneously, and anyone can then use that. And some of the um, new automated coding um, projects that are out there, particularly international relations, are beginning to do that. And I think we should be doing that so that, you know, so practitioners can actually use some of the data we're collecting as an early warning device. So there's an election coming up in, I don't know, Mozambique next month. Well, what do we know about, what are people saying about that? What do we know about it? Is this likely to be a problem? What's likely to be a problem? Well, if we were actually systematically collecting and coding the data that's available, we could tell practitioners that. And that's what I think um, I would like to um, do more of. And that's what I think um, is, is a really fruitful, exciting um, potential area in which uh, the field could develop. Thank you very much. Good. Excellent.